You know, deer habitat and wildlife habitat, it's something we've been doing a long time, uh, decades. And, uh, and boy, things have changed. You know, Dylan brought this topic up to me along with another one that we'll talk about for deer hunting. But there's a lot that's changed over the last 20 years. And what people thought was a good thing or fads that caught on. And then there's been changes. And we're going to bust those open and talk about them. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, of course, we want you to learn. But we see these consistencies over and over again. Um, a lot of these, even things that work in one area, there's things that are are great. I would say miscanthus grass is a plant. You know, it's a, a grass that you can plant ornamental grass more where it doesn't spread. It's non-invasive. Great for under power lines. Um, limited application. You know, I might recommend it on five, five, ten percent of the time at most. Um, Dylan, have you recommended it all this year? No, and I actually just saw a planting on a client's. That looked pretty good. Don't picture myself recommending. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. We see some of this stuff and. Yeah, it's going to grow to this height in three years, and it does not because the soil's battered, it's in the shade. Or someone spent three thousand dollars to go a half mile, and they could have spent a hundred bucks to switch grass and one one hundredth of the time spent to plant and had something better. But there is a place under power lines where you need the height, and you can't plant trees um, or shrubs. So, but again, you know, good product, not good for everything. And uh, in fact, we've learned that over the years. And it's something we watch. And I'm gonna talk about some of these um, myths, um, fads that took place, and not just that they don't work, but why? And what might be something better for you, even if they work a percentage of the time. Like hinge cutting, number one. And you know, I grew up in Michigan. Michigan back in the uh, 90s, 2000s. And there are habitat managers still that every property they go to recommend hinge cutting. Kevin Smith was on a property on Saturday, I believe, and he had someone from Michigan recommend to a client that he was to follow up and clean up that uh, they, they hinge cut the majority of the property. The trees were 12 to 15 inches in diameter. The guy was barber chairing and cutting. Barber chairs went 15 feet in the air um, where it splits and then it pivots 15 feet of the other air on a thin slice of bark almost and remaining inner portion of the cambium layer and it just splits off and falls to the side you know it's really dangerous the guy knew that wasn't accurate they shouldn't be doing but the problem is some of the habitat managers that's all they know so they don't know how to apply it's kind of like if you like miscanthus grass you recommend it every client you go to if you like soybeans you recommend it to every client you go to and you like hinge cutting so you recommend it to every client you go to and there's still unfortunately consultants out there like that hinge cutting is a very specific tool, we recommend it 15, 20% of the time. And I know, Dylan, you've recommended hinge cutting just on a handful this year. Yeah, I was just on five client parcels uh, within the last week or so, and I recommended it on one. And I recommended it yesterday on a 300 acre parcel um, on about 20 acres out of the 300, just because that's what fit for that habitat. But there were fits for everything else on other portions. So even sometimes we recommend it, it's not on obviously on the entire parcel, um, you know, for most of the time. But uh, it's March 14th right now. How many clients have you worked on this year, do you uh, think? Come back to me, I gotta add them all up. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know right off the top of my head. He's been, Dylan's been stacking them in, in bunches where I take more of a, you know, monthly approach going to eight to 10 clients and so, I've worked December, January, February, and March, and that's uh, approximately 34 clients right around there. And uh, Dylan, you probably worked that many in the last two months or something, <laughs> but it's he's, he's stacking them in. Where I, our, my, our schedules are different. Dylan leaves some time off during the summer, and where I'm just doing consistently smaller amounts. So I have my schedules all the way set through September, my September Ohio clip trip and then Dylan yours is set too but we have some roller coaster of ebbs and flows of that in there but bottom line is we get to see a lot and we'll recommend something if we think it's a good thing there's nothing off the table that will help clients we just we have a goal of doing what's best for our clients hinge cutting fits when you have more pole size timber in that four to six seven inch range you're looking at maple ash sometimes if your ash is dying, you want to complete cut it so you get stump sprouting. If it's half dead and you hinge cut it, you might get dead hinges in the future too. Um, oak, you can hinge cut. Cherry is brittle. Birch is brittle. Yellow birch, you can hinge cut more than white birch. Uh, you don't cut, you don't hinge cut popple. You never ever, which I've seen on properties, you never girdle popple or poplar and, uh, and aspen. 
you cut them completely so it could, because they stump sprout. And if you girdle them, you kill them all together. It's one of the best resources you have. Box elder, which we're gonna hinge cut some today. Box elder is great to hinge cut. It's always leaning somewhere and you can cut it, let it go down slowly, safe. You can even do it in cold weather. So there's certain things you can hinge cut, but you're doing that size appropriate and habitat appropriate. Most of the time what we see hinge cuts, and I've been seeing this for 12, 15 years, especially in Michigan, is there'll be hinge cut pockets that people pay good money for, but it's in the shade of the canopy of the hardwoods around it. And they simply just die out after a couple of years because you took trees that were 30, 40 feet tall, skinny, you hinge cut them. Now they're not exposed to sunlight, so they just simply die. And it's a waste of resource. We see that a lot too where you need to remove that canopy first. And, and I know consultants will go on a property and they'll say, well, we, you know, we can't remove those big trees or we're waiting for logging to be done. So someone will say, well, you can just hinge cut. But you have to get that canopy down first. It doesn't matter, that's the absolute. You have to say, we have to get sunlight to the ground. So the majority of the time at timber harvest of mature trees or cutting down large undesirables and junk will help people see that where it's twisted, it's multi-crowned, it was damaged from earlier logging where a wheel rubbed against it. And then now you have this big area of bark that's gone, it's been scarred and that timber value is cut down to just a small fraction of what it could have been. I've seen that on a hard maple stand in Ohio and it was, it was tragic you know that they they hurt these trees so bad with scarring of a previous logging activity so it really ruined the value of their timber so we'll look at trees and we'll help people make decisions you should cut this mature tree down that's a leaner a subordinate junk tree and not this one but you have to get that canopy down first and what you find is when you do that or you have logging done you don't need to hinge cut because 90% has been cleaned, completed by the logger. You have other things to worry about. Food plot locations, access, stand locations, travel corridors, mock scrapes, water holes, switchgrass plantings. You have other things, other, other projects. So now that cutting and removing the canopy that was your priority next to food plots and access and stand locations has become one of the lowest priorities to actually going back in there and hinge cut and clean anything up with hinge cutting because simply it's number 10 or 15 or 20 on the list. And that's what we often see. That's why we don't recommend hinge cutting very often, 15, 20% of the time, 10% depending on the number of clients. Number two, 100% acreage improvements. The old way, let's take every square inch and improve it for wildlife. It's not appropriate. You need areas for walking through, blowing your scent into. You need areas that you can say, rabbits, pheasants, grouse, deer live here. They don't live here. That allows you to access allows you to hike on your property, not spook wildlife species. But when it comes to deer, you can't have bedding areas in the wrong spot just because it was good habitat for a bedding area. You can't put food plots in an open field just because it was a big open field in view of your cabin. And every time you go out of the cabin, you spook deer, but you're putting it there just because it was convenient. It was the open space on your property. You can't improve every square inch because then you never know where wildlife species, and especially deer, are going to be. So every time you go out in the woods, you spook deer. You take an 80 acre parcel, if you put bedding areas and food plots in the wrong spot, even just one of them. I had someone from a national deer association organization tell me, well, we believe that you should have at least one food plot that's unhunted on your property. Folks, every food plot to the deer should look as if it's unhunted because if you have one food plot bad on your 100 acre parcel, which our average clients, about 100 acres, half of my clients are 60 acres or less each year. I went to one last week on Friday, there was a 10 acre parcel. And I still was with them. I think I left their house at 4.30 in the afternoon after meeting them at 9. So this isn't, still takes the same amount of time to draw. They still had a lot of things they could do. You compartmentalize a lot more. The bottom line is you have one food plot that's bad on your land, even a 500 acre parcel. If you have a 10 acre food plot that's bad, it sets a tone and ruins your habitat for the entire parcel because deer, if they're not going to a food plot during the daylight, that means they're feeding somewhere else that last hour of the daylight. They're not coming onto the property till well after dark. That means they're a long ways away, at least 300 yards, sometimes 400 yards away because they don't want to get close to that food plot. They recognize that this is a bad spot to be during daylight because they smell you, see you, or hear you. So you have to think about that. You can't improve 100% of the parcel like the previous schooled thought. How can we take this area and make it a pond? Because it's a good spot, it's a low area, there's runoff, let's make a pond. But it doesn't fit. We've been to a lot of water holes or water sources in the middle of the property. They pull deer away from people's tree stands. There's a better way to do it and a better way to define that movement on your property thoughtfully so that you create a balance of all wildlife species and a great place to attract, grow, and hunt a quality deer herd.
Buck home range planting. If you went by the science, and there's a three, three mile square home range of a mature buck, why even bother? How about just set up some good hunting spots in your properties and let them come through whenever? The problem is, is you can actually destroy your property if you look at it like, well, I, can, I can't actually manage these bucks. I can't ever manage these bucks. I had someone the other day say, hey, we get in our neighborhood, we share photos. These bucks move all over the place. Well, yeah, they do. But when it comes, to, if you do it right, you can take one 40 acre parcel, 20 acre parcel, 100 acre parcel, and dictate that the majority of the daylight movement, which is just a fraction of the overall home range and nighttime movement, and you can dictate that you have a high percentage of those mature bucks living in and around and focusing on your land during the daylight hours. The problem is, most people never get to experience it. Most people do it like that commoner said. Hey, we share all these bucks. They're all over the place during the daylight. That's because everyone's probably doing it wrong because most people aren't doing it right. Most people are following the traditional science or traditional way to manage your property. We see that all the time. That's why we go to properties is to fix them. So we go there, we fix the property, make good recommendations. And it's amazing how you can start to take that mature random buck movement and throw it down to a small area. It especially helps when your neighbors are doing things like driving with an ATV, spooking deer, hunting stands with the wrong wind, and certainly putting bedding areas and food pots in the wrong spot so that they spook deer every time they're on the property. You can go one fence over and the deer will act completely different on that parcel versus the parcel on the other side of the fence. When you get to experience it often, that's what we love about clients. I feel that we have higher expectations for our clients than our clients do even hiring us in the first place because they've never seen it. And we, we want to deliver that to them. I always talk about you know being the herd influencer. Less than 5% of all whitetail properties are actually herd influencers. The rest are just like that commenter said where we're sharing all these bucks all over the place. That's not a good thing because that shows when you see those bucks exercising that three mile home range, that's because they don't have any daylight area they feel safe. And for that, you're going to limit drastically the mature bucks you see, not only your own, on your own parcel, but the mature bucks you see in an entire neighborhood. That's a very, very bad thing. Number four, hardwoods are good. Looked at, hey, buy a great stand of hardwoods. You can practice practice good timber, timber management activities, TSI, timber stand improvement. You can pay for your land with this good harvest of timber coming out. What you end up doing is managing trees instead of wildlife. I've seen it back in the day, you know, 500 acre parcel. Here's a 500 acre parcel. We'll take this area and we're going to cut the timber. Five years later, we'll do this area. Five years later, do this. Five years later, five years later, five years later. You get the picture. 70 years later, 80 years later, you're starting the whole process over again. That's professional timber stand improvement, one of the ways to do it. The problem is the deer are always relating to changing bedding areas, changing food sources, changing browse areas. That means you are always playing catch up. You're not saying this is a bedding area right here. This is a food source. Deer travel from point A to point B. Daytime movement between bedding areas, afternoon, morning, evening movement to an evening movement around food. You have to dictate what deer do on a daily basis, and you can even on 40 acres. And that's why t traditional timber stand improvement when it comes to hardwoods is a very bad thing. Always remember, the lower the value of your timber on the property, with the exception of being too wet, too rocky, habitat, the better the wildlife value, whitetail value, and return that you have for your overall investment. Hardwoods are bad. That old way of thinking has changed. Bad timber is good when it comes to wildlife and whitetail species. Number five, you need to have H2O. I don't think it's a bad thing, you know, when you have water on your property, rivers, ponds, swamps, creeks, whatever it might be, seepages, springs, then you typically have diversity. A lot of times people have mixed hardwood and they have swamps. More habitat, more edge equals more wildlife, whitetail opportunity. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, that can just dictate that you have a lot of things going on in your property and that's attractive to all wildlife species, including whitetail. Not bad, but if you have a dry property, you can take water holes and specifically place them in locations even safely meaning that you can put them in a container where there's limited amount of mud to support the EHD and midge that requires dried cracking mud around natural water holes and ponds, you'll find that likely 
tank water holes are safer than actually natural water holes in spreading H EHT. But bottom line with that, you can take water holes and specifically dictate where bucks travel on a daily basis on the way to food, coming from food or between bedding areas. Whereas if you have random water on your property, you can't say more deer or more wildlife is attracted because of that water, other than the different, the variety of habitat. But if you have water in the wrong spot, you actually pull deer away from your stand locations you have water in the middle of your property. You're not going to go sit there and blow out your whole property on 30 acres or 50 or 80 acres. Instead, having no water is better than water when it comes to dictating deer traffic, just like the buck I shot with my bull last year. You ha and I've shot many near or traveling to or from or at water holes. They become a great spot to hunt and they help align your habitat features of bedding, food, bedding and bedding. You just have to apply it and match it to the lay of the land and topography and they can be great to add it but just because you have water on your land is not necessarily a good start to your deer habitat and wildlife dreams number six conifer for plantations we got a property this this week big plantations of red pine they've chiseled out already five acres of food plots they are going to take another three acres or four acres out of those pine plantations and get rid of them then they're going in in the rest of the pine plantations and they're making up to 40 yard by 40 yard openings to allow sunlight in there so they actually get regeneration and break up looking under those red pines where you can see 150 yards right now in the snow so they actually put browse in those conifer plantations so Unfortunately, people in Wisconsin, they might be enrolled in a restrictive MFL program where they can't take those out. But if you can remove those conifers, they're a great base form of cover. You go and remove those pockets. No different than we're providing pockets of switchgrass in the field, allowing early successional growth to grow up around it. We're surrounding that field in switchgrass. Does it make sense? Switchgrass, conifer, red cedar, spruce, they can be great base bedding covers. And then you change the inside at a level of 40, 50, 60% to make it more diverse. No different than you're taking, they have wet red cedar eradication programs out in Missouri. And I've seen those where they take 40 acres of red cedar, they remove it, they put hardwood in its place, a bunch of tubes, five years later, half those tubes are knocked over, the hardwoods are eaten, and they have nothing. And it kind of gets back to, I'll just do a little rant here for a second. Rants are always fun, right, Dylan? Oh, yeah. Let her rip. <laughs> I saw a comment on, uh, it was actually Mark Kenyon was out here from Wired to Hunt, and he put some pictures. He was out here shed hunting just with Dylan. Dylan happened to be working with Meat Eater and Mark Kenyon, and they're coming through the area. So we had an impromptu shed hunt for a few hours, which was a lot of fun. We even busted my side-by-side. -side. Or should I say we? That was not a weed. That was a, that was a Jeff. <laughs> Does, Dylan, do you have video of that? I do not. You, okay. I think you have a picture. I yeah, I do have a picture. But anyways, um, we got that fixed right away, which is a good thing. But um, I saw someone not comment on that on Mark's post. Just say that, you know, I support spreading invasives. And, you know, Jeff supports spreading invasives. And couldn't be further from the truth. Obviously, the person was grossly misinformed. They just made a comment out of ignorance. But they, the bottom line is, is that I look at it like, and this is more the truth, the truth behind that is someone takes a 10 acre field of autumn olive and they just remove it all. Very, very negligent. Because there's wild, wildlife species that relied on that. Songbirds, nesting birds, grouse, pheasant, escape cover, deer, rabbits. So to remove all that cover with no immediate response to where those deer should go, where those critters should go, where those birds, wildlife species should go, you're destroying those wildlife species. So when you don't have a plan for immediate replacement then you do it in stages. If you want to remove 10 acres out of a field of autumn olive, remove a few acres at a time, scattered, and replace it with something that's going to be a good alternative. Willows, silky willows, hybrid willows, hybrid poplars, shrubs, nine bark, whatever you want to plant, red osier dogwood, conifers. Put something in its place, let that establish, and then remove more. So do it in stages. So you're being responsible to wildlife species. You know, someone who likes conservation, takes into picture the entire balance of the habitat, wildlife, whatever's there. And they make appropriate decisions to not hurt wildlife or the native habitat that's there. So I can see someone replacing and working on invasives over time. But to simply remove a solid patch of cover that's being used in attracting wildlife and not have an alternative is the lack of being a conservation. In fact, I think someone should spend jail time for something like that. They should be fined heavily, something. There should be repercussion and punishment for something like that when people neglect 
to offer alternatives and alternative cover choices to wildlife species that are counting on the invasives that you're removing. That's where I'd never recommend spreading invasives. What I do recommend is being responsible within the replacement of invasives. And that's no different than removing a big pocket of red cedar, where wildlife species depend on that. But it's a great form of base cover. Same with conifer, pines, switchgrass even. You can have 30 acres of switchgrass, and that's a monoculture, where you might have some rabbits and pheasants around the edges, and that's about it. Bird, deer don't want to live in there. There's no bird species, really, that enjoy that. So in that case, you'd create, take out pockets. You're trying to do things responsibly and to take into the, the entire holistic approach of how can I balance wildlife, invasives, non-invasives, replacing invasives, and doing it correctly so you don't destroy. And that's where conifer plantations, those road plantations, we try to eliminate those at least in stages. You could take 40 acres of conifer on a property out of 300 acres and there's a 40 acre stand of conifer they established 25 years ago. Well, you can select cut at a heavier level so you increase more browse and sunlight to the ground. You can remove pockets if legal within your plan to do so. But there's more than one way to skin a cat. The bottom line is complete monocultures of conifer, switchgrass are a thing of the past and are changing thankfully. Number seven, CRP is good, CRP is bad. If all that cover is laying down in December, January, February, March, and you're providing no cover to wildlife species, it doesn't matter how cool the mix was and how much you paid for it, which is really expensive. You have to separate food and cover when it comes to providing great areas. I'm hoping CRP someday will change so that it forces people to plant blocks of different types of habitat within the same field. It doesn't have to ever grow into shrubs and trees or anything else. You could have pollinator blends, early successional growth, ragweed, goldenrod, but goldenrod by itself, I've even seen people teach goldenrod's great. No, it's not. It's a part of good habitat. You have to have actual cover. If you have a field of goldenrod, that's worthless. I don't care how many wildlife species you see in June, July, August. If it's 10 acres out of your 40 acres, you just have a big waste of area because there's no cover when wildlife needs it the most, which is November, January, March, not July and August, June, May, during that time. So CRP used to be good when it came to wildlife. It's not, and there's enough information out there and enough proven success and experience to show otherwise. And number eight, I'll close with this, that science when it comes to deer habitat is bad. You know what's interesting, and I haven't mentioned this, but I've written some articles 10, 12, 15 years ago talking about how bad sound is, you know, soundproofing your land, making sure that deer can't hear you, see you, smell you. We talk about when you're removing deer, when you're going in after dark, retrieving a deer, you leave the machine running and you keep your voices to a whisper so that deer can't hear you because why? Good hunters have known for decades that the human voice is this one of the scariest things to a deer. Seeing a human is one of the scariest things to a deer. There's a recent study that came out and illustrated that. Again, science, decades hunters have known that a voice is bad, that noise is bad. Seeing humans is a bad thing. We don't need a study to show that. Much of the time, science, because science can't prove on small properties, how small a home range a mature buck can have during the daylight hours. They're looking at those studies over many, many thousands of acres on public land, big corporate holdings, maybe not even in your state, but they're not accurately reflecting what you can do on a small parcel and the potential of your small parcel. So whether it's timber management, big deer movements, the perfect great CRP mixes, the science of putting those mixes together, the science of studying deer, timber, Professional timber management doesn't apply to your small parcel, whether that parcel is 500, 800 acres of size, five or eight acres, or like that 10 acres that I went to the other day. You always have to blend science and good practices with actual experience and good practices for the wildlife you're trying to promote, whether you're removing invasives and you do it at a staged, you know, in stages, so you don't displace and kill those wildlife populations, or you're managing your timber, making sure you're not hinge cutting. You know, I, I know people, there's consultants out there that they think hinge cutting is bad. That's a bad thing too. You can never have too, there's too many absolutes sometimes. And uh, there are absolutes. I don't like destroying wildlife populations. You're saying you're conservation of the year because you're planting something in its place, but if you had to kill wildlife in large areas to do so, that's not being a conservationist. Again, there's balance. I hope you see the balance in each one of these things, why they're bad, what you can do about it to make something good, what, what is a good alternative uh, to that practice. And when you're going forward in your deer habitat this year, you recognize that there's some myths out there 
urban legends, things that have been held on to for years. And thankfully, deer habitat and deer hunting practices have been changing. They've especially been changing the last several decades where people are specifically paying a lot of money to manage their land. And those are practices that they're using and are working that can help you on your land in your hunting situations. And I'm not even saying you have to hire us. We try to provide enough information here that you can take good practices and apply them to your land. And uh, whether you hire Dylan, Joe in Michigan, portion of Wisconsin, and uh, Kevin out in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and a lot of those, they'll fly to parcels or Dylan and I, then uh, you can find great practices just by watching the videos. Check on my website. I have over 600 articles on my website. We don't push very much. But um, they're all about these topics and can help you have a great herd and a great hunt this fall. Folks, I want to make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.